Awesome. Well, good morning and welcome to, I guess, day one of the talks at Epstick Kelly. Um, my name is Will and this is Travis. Hello. <clears throat> Today we're here to talk to you about our Netflix layered approach to reducing risk of credential compromise in the cloud. Uh, today we're going to focus more specifically on how we do so in AWS. Uh, but we hope to introduce you to, uh, if, if you can see my shirt, how we build our pizza of services at Netflix. All right, this is starting well. Slides are frozen. <laughs> Computer's frozen. Everything's frozen. <laughs> it's fixed. Yeah. Don't worry, we're professionals. Yeah. We got this so under control. Today we're going to build a Netflix pizza together. And we're going to talk about the various different ingredients that we've developed over the last few years that we have layered together, hopefully, in such a large, delicious, disgusting pizza that no attacker would want to even partake in trying to complete that. Uh, so today we're going to talk about things like credential compromise detection, a tool that we wrote a few years ago that Travis wrote called Repo Kid, uh, something that we call Role Protect and how we use that in coordination with our delivery pipeline, uh, some anomaly detection that we've done with some CloudTrail analysis and what our IAM roles are actually using, uh, how we got rid of static keys in our environment, uh, another thing called API Protect, and much, much more. So today we're going to walk through building a pizza, starting very first with Travis and the crust. Okay, every good pizza has to start with a crust, right? Let's do a little poll. Who likes deep dish? No, oh, I would have thought more. Thin crust. Okay, thin crust seems to be winning. Cauliflower crust? <laughs> Did you know that there is actually such a thing as the World Pizza Championships, and they have this activity called acrobatic dough tossing. <laughs> like, what is that? How do, what do you do for acrobatic dough tossing? It sounds like it could be dangerous. Anyway, with a good pizza, we want to start off with a crust. And our first ingredient is the crust, and when I mean crust, I'm talking about account segmentation. The way I like to think of it is, is like this. If the account gets compromised, then we want to be able to contain that damage to just within the specific account. And it's basically like a fire break. Now, did you know that in 1906 in San Francisco, the big earthquake hit a 7.9 magnitude at 5.12 in the morning? And after that, fires started breaking out. And in fact, those fires coalesced and became one big fire. So much so that by the next day, they were actually afraid that the entire city might burn down. And so they thought about how to solve this, how to prevent the city from burning down, and the Army Corps of Engineers came up with a very brilliant solution. And so the next night, they started dynamiting mansions along Van Ness, and they created a fire break, which is exactly like this, except for it's made out of people's mansions. <laughs> so basically, it's the same thing. Uh, fire break. Uh, we have a part of the forest here that's on fire, and we would like to contain the burning to just that part of the forest and not lose the entire forest. So that's what we're doing with account level segmentation. At Netflix, we have this concept called the paved road, which is basically this nice suite of tools that we provide developers. Now, if you're a developer on the paved road, everything should just work nicely. You've got all these tools. You don't have to think about much. Things just kind of work out. But of course, sometimes you need to do something different. Sometimes developers are experienced and they want to do crazy shit. Has anybody seen this show? Yeah, OK, I like this show a lot. This is Dark Tourist. And basically, the, the point of this show is that this guy intentionally puts himself in situations which would be concerning to some. Uh, but the point is, is that he enjoys it. He gets a rush out of it. Now, that's not the point for our developers. They're not doing it just for the rush. But we do have power users that need to do a certain thing. And they know exactly which permissions they need to do it. At Netflix, our security team is not supposed to be a blocking team. We're not in the business of telling developers, no, you can't do this. You can't do this thing that's your job. And so instead, we provide a paved road, which is nice. You should stay on it. But if you're going to do something out there, then we will put you in your own account. And so you can have these relatively powerful permissions and not affect the general ecosystem. And so it's nice for separation of duties. You have these power users over in one account, but they are not able to affect our main environments, and they are not able to affect the sensitive environments, which also get their own account. So sensitive applications, put them in their own account, and now 
they're off there with a very limited set of users that can access it, limited set of users that can access sensitive data. And it's a very nice control for us to be able to apply. Now, if you're interested in applying account level segmentation, the, what you're gonna wanna do is invest in some tooling. Spinning up accounts, deleting accounts, modifying metadata with accounts is something that we've invested in a lot. If you're interested in it, we can definitely chat afterwards. But to apply this control effectively, you do need to invest in some tooling to make the account management a little bit easier. Next up, it's sauce time. Now for sauce, we are talking about removing all static keys from our environment where possible. The reason we want to remove static keys is because they have a problem. As the name implies, they never expire. And so a lot of developers have gotten themselves into big time trouble because they get a static key, they think they're managing it well, they make a mistake, and then next thing you know, the credentials are out there on GitHub. So let's see some examples of this. My AWS account was hacked, and I have to pay $50,000 bill, how can I reduce the amount of money I need to pay? <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> yeah, that would be one way, you could declare bankruptcy. Better yet to not end up in this situation. Or how about this poor developer? I was billed for 14,000 USD on Amazon Web Services with a scream emoji. <laughs> what happened? A file containing my AWS credentials had, hadn't been ignored in Git, so when I pushed my local repository, even my credentials went online and attackers got it and ran up a bunch of damages. Or how about Ryan Hellier's AWS nightmare? Leaked access keys result in $6,000 bill overnight. What I like about this is the quote, but those little horrid AWS keys were sitting on the repository in view of everyone. <laughs> I agree with that sentiment. They are horrid little AWS keys and we don't want them in. But that being said, we do need credentials. So what are we gonna swap it with? Short-lived keys that are delivered automatically and rotated. And the way we get this is by giving every application a role and then the role is provided with these short-lived credentials by the EC2 metadata service. Next up, cheese. What do we want? The gooeyest, drippiest, melt-in-your-mouth cheese we can get, and for that we are talking about permission right sizing. So the way it works, I like to think of it um, like a tailor, which I'll show you in a second, but basically we get these static set of permissions, and then from there we measure and see exactly what the application needs. So if I'm a new application in Netflix, I might get you know, some basic S3 read, uh, SQS actions we've seen people need a lot. And this is the same policy that's granted to everybody. Now, as that implies, we don't have a least privilege model. So this grand provisioning is basically like the off the rack suit that you get. It doesn't fit you yet, but it, we'll get it there. Now we start measuring, and by that what we're doing is we're looking at two feeds of data that we get. Access Advisor, which tells you for a given service, has it been used within a certain threshold of time? And the other one we look at is CloudTrail, which can tell you in some cases what actions have been called and when and by who. So by putting these data sources together, this is the equivalent of measuring to your specific body what suit needs to fit you. And then from there, we do the last step in the tailoring, which is trim it down. And when I say trim it down, what we're actually doing is rewriting the policy from the initial base policy to the now custom fit policy that has just the stuff your application is using for least privilege. Now, my favorite part about the outcome of this is that unused applications converge to zero permissions. This is really important because think about some of the riskiest applications that you have in your environment. Uh, they were being developed, people were excited about them, people were working on them, they got all these permissions provisioned, and then what happened? People left the company, people started working on other projects, people forgot that they existed. This happens all the time, it's hard to stay on top of applications. But with this automated approach, we actually get those applications that aren't used going to zero, which definitely de-risks them for our environment. Now I mentioned that we have a tool that does this, it's RepoKit, it is open source, this is my baby, but that being said, if you wanna use it and give feedback, good feedback, bad feedback, we love all feedback. Uh, if you are using it already, I'd love to hear about your experiences. If you're interested in using it, let's chat. And with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Will for our next ingredient. Thank you, Travis. Now, 
I love cheese as much as everyone, but I do love my protein as well. So we're gonna dig in and talk about some good pepperoni that we're gonna throw on this pizza and how we do paved road for credentials. Now Travis mentioned that we don't do static keys anymore. So how do we do temporary credentials? You might ask, how do we give credentials to our developers? How do we manage developing applications locally? What does that actually look like? And one thing that we wanted to do and is build a centralized place, sort of like the Presidio Modelo in Cuba. You have a central guard check that you can see everything into every cell. You have a total view of the universe there in that prison. And that's kind of what we wanted in our credential world. We wanted to build a suite of tools or a tool that we could actually provision credentials across all of our accounts, all roles, all applications if needed, and be able to track who got those and when, where did they go, how are they being used. And so that really led us to thinking about how should we develop this. There were some ways that we did credentialing in the past at Netflix where we'd allow developers to SSH on the box and use credentials from there. Uh, there were ways that we'd actually, you could curl a endpoint and they would give you some temporary credentials through a SAML federation type flow. Uh, but it, wasn't, it didn't really feel right for us. There were various different ways of developers getting credentials, various different ways of them being actually minted. Um, not really solidified to one unique place to make monitoring very simple. Um, and so what we did was build this tool called Console Me. And I think when it was first developed, it was like console me. And then we just like, no, console me. Mm. It's like a big teddy bear. It's a tool that you love and you want to hug all the time. Uh, but it's our central place for credentials. And when I say credentials, I mean users, applications, you name it. If you want to develop as the application repo kid and do some local development, you actually ask console me for that permission. <clears throat> now, Travis mentioned we have many, many accounts. The way that we kind of do account segmentation and roles is that there's individual groups that you become part of when you want to have access to an account and more specifically the role in that account. So Travis and I might be admins across our organization, so we have admin access into our different accounts. And so we'd actually be group members of those specific groups that provide us that access. Console Me has information and insight into all those mappings to see what groups exist for the different uh, console roles, what owners exist for our different application roles, and it's our authoritative source for understanding, do you have access to a role or not? So the flow is quite simple. If I'm the user on the left there, I would request credentials from console me. Now this, this comes twofold. If you're going through the console and you want to actually access the AWS through the browser, you would single sign on into console me. From there, console me knows who you are, what groups you are a part of. And from that point forward, console me knows what credentials you can actually request. So you make that request in the browser and console me will then say, okay, are you a member? Uh, our group membership is owned by the centralized identity authority called Pandora that our identity access engineering team owns. If you think about it as a workday driven identity access uh, tied with our Google backing and a bunch of other things to come up with a centralized identity where every team has a unique ID and has references to what, what access they should have. So console me would reach out to Pandora and say, hey, is Travis a member of the security account for the role admin? Pandora will answer yes or no. If it's a yes, then console me will reach out and create what's called an assume role action. Uh, in AWS, there's things called this, there's a service called the security token service. It is what crafts the temporary credentials. Uh, it's what the EC2 instances or the servers in AWS are getting credentials from. And so console me is using that same thing. But the key piece here that we love and hold dear to our hearts is that when we're actually assuming the role in AWS, we're injecting what we call scope down policies and we're putting CIDR based injections on top of those. So now when developers are getting credentials, they're getting credentials that are IP restricted to the VPN that they're actually connected to. So even if a developer accidentally pushed credentials to GitHub within that hour window that they're valid, they're not valid for anyone else that had them. They have to be from that developer's laptop and have that connection out of our VPN. So console me asks for the credentials with that scope down policy. IAM so um, kindly delivers those back to us and then console me will return those transparently to the user. Now I mentioned the, the console login flow is through an SSO. This flow is also available via an API and our mutual TLS. So at Netflix, everyone's issued a cert 
that gives them their identity for a short period of time. And with that cert, you can actually request Console Me to get app application credentials, the same role that you would use in console, but you're getting those delivered locally. Um, <clears throat> we've even gone as far as creating a metadata service that you could run on your laptop to mimic as if you're an EC2. It'll handle rotation of your credential and renewing that on the back end. And it's really, really been real helpful and made the developer flow for credentials quite nice. No longer do we see rogue developers potentially SSHing into an, an instance, pulling credentials down and having a six hour long credential. We can scope our credential periods down very tight and have this automatic refresh in the background. But most importantly, it's a central place that we can audit and log all access to credentials in our environment. We know if Travis is requesting access to a role that he really shouldn't. If I've tried to trick console me to give me credentials for an application that I don't own, we can see those metrics, we can see those logs, and we can detect anomalies in how we're actually using things. Uh, the most important stuff for us is that we've actually locked it to our environment so that any sort of mishap by mistake on purpose, those credentials that might just migrate off someone's box no longer work and it's been very, very effective to us. And the response from the developers have been uh, really, really positive. The, the workflow has been pretty seamless and we're able to uh, move easily in, in an agile world in the cloud. Uh, now the worst part of the pizza, I think is the olives. I'm like a meat lovers guy, like keep the veggies to the side, maybe a salad before so that I don't stuff my face. But one thing we wanted to do is kind of keep this same methodology of developer credentials are locked. And we wanted to see how could we lock credentials in the cloud that are actually attached to the services that we're running every day. Uh, does anyone subscribe to Netflix in the crowd? Everyone raised their hands, just to note on record. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so if you think about your flow and you're requesting uh, to watch a stream from Netflix, all that happens through AWS. Many, many microservices are running and we want to make sure that if there's a vulnerability in one of those microservices and an attacker or researcher somewhat or some person gets a credential, they're not valid from where they are. And so that's where we're trying to prevent instance credentials from being used on instance or off instance, excuse me. So if an attacker a researcher steals credentials through a vulnerability like server-side request forgery or X XXE um, injection, they do not work. And so what we've essentially done is we've created this automation that maps our entire account. We'll describe our VPC IDs, VPC endpoint IDs, and NAT gateway IDs. We encapsulate those into what's called a managed policy in AWS, and we put those on every role that we feel that we can protect and it's basically a deny statement that says, deny anything if these conditions aren't met. And then it's looking to see if the IP matches, if it's from the VPC or VPC endpoint. And from that, it's been really, really effective for us to make sure that credentials are locked to our environment. Now, the way our network is kind of set up, we have an internal and an external subnet. And so this methodology only can be applied when you know the IP source that calls are going to come from. We're, we're so large of a deployment, we can only put this on our internal subnet deployed roles, so there's still a gap. But we're able to actually prevent at least 50% of our infrastructure or something like that, where we can have some protection and layer that pizza a little more in our environment. And so a real life example of this was a third party application we hosted. A researcher found a, a plugin vulnerability, actually pulled credentials from that service, and then they were unable to actually use those credentials from their box. So theoretically, we had tested this, we had come up with the methodology, but we actually had a real life example once where this actually happened and this protection actually uh, was able to save us uh, and it didn't allow that researcher to do anything from their machine. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about how to actually craft that, let's chat. And so now I'll hand it back to Travis for some mushroom action. You, lockdown. Lockdown? Yeah. Yep. All right, I will be talking about lockdown. So <clears throat> in lockdown, delivery lockdown, Netflix, it's not uh, unknown that we use a tool called Spinnaker. It's a tool that we originally developed and now has uh, gained many company initiatives. I think Google is a big player in development of Spinnaker as well, but it's our central deployment source at Netflix. All our uh, engineers use Spinnaker to deploy and it's how we actually do our day-to-day -day pipeline and constant delivery and how our 
cloud at Netflix can be so dynamic. So one of the things we wanted to do is lock down who could actually deliver what and use what role. If you're at Netflix, you, Travis talked about Repo Kid. Removes the roles that you don't use anymore. But what's a little unknown or what we don't really talk about much is how did we get into the situation where we had all these roles that had more permissions than maybe what they needed. And that's how we use our Spinnaker pipeline to deploy fast for our developers. When you deploy a new application at Netflix, Spinnaker calls out into infrastructure that Travis and I's team owns, and we provision a role for that application. That role has what we would consider 95% of any of the API calls that you'd possibly want to make based on the core services that we believe we use at Netflix. Then your application actually uses that role for the 90 days, and then RepoKid comes in behind the scenes and cleans up the, the permissions that you didn't use. One of the things with Spinnaker is that you're able to choose and deploy to the accounts that you have access to. And just because you're in an account might not necessarily mean that you have access to all the roles in that account. And so we've done an initiative where we're able to actually tag uh, applications roles to owners so that you can only use application roles that your application should actually use. For the most part, your application roles should match your application, but there's very few cases where you might have many different applications using a similar role for just to make it very easy and the permissions are always the same, just the application name changes. But now we're able to actually put some protections in Spinnaker that only allows you to deploy a role if you own that application. And so it's what we're doing with application whitelisting in Spinnaker to kind of protect our role as a, a way that we identified that you might be able to privilege escalate if you just chose a role with more permission. Um, with that, also we brought in protections that I believe Google initially uh, contributed to our project called Fiat. That gives you owner locking for each application such that you can only make application uh, changes, only deploy an application, and so on and so forth if you're the owner of that application. Uh, prior to the Fiat case, it was if you were able to deploy to that account, could you actually deploy someone else's application? So we wanted to lock that down as well. So the, those two pieces together have been uh, really, really uh, beneficial to our layering that security and making a better uh, cloud environment and more secure. So definitely prevents privilege escalation and uh, allows me to at least sleep better at night. Uh, so this has been rolled out and has been very, very powerful for us. Um, and with this, if you ever try to use a role that you're not allowed to, uh, we have alerts that go off to our team and we're able to see, hey, so-and-so is trying to use a role. Uh, and so this was actually something that was kind of a, came full circle to say, we think that people might be trying to use roles that they shouldn't. Let's put this in place and let's see what kind of things come back. And we're actually to see some experiments, they just wanted to use a role that they knew they had permissions. And so they went ahead and tried using other roles. And we can see that use case now and reach out to the developers proactively and say, hey, is there permission you need that you don't normally get? Let, let us help you. <clears throat> and with that, talking about peppers again. Do you want to talk about this? Sure. Want to? Yeah, whatever. Whatever you, whatever you like. Go ahead. So. Will had mentioned our first bit of signals, right? We want to know when things that are happening in our environment shouldn't be happening. And one of the things that we want to know about, uh, I mentioned previously that we have the EC2 metadata service, and it's providing credentials. Now, it's a lot better shape to be in than the static credentials that we had before, but we still have credentials, and those still carry AWS permissions with them. So one of the things we'd like to know about is when those credentials are taken out of our environment and people attempt to use them. So as Will mentioned, with console.me, this is already blocked. So we don't actually have an issue where they're going to take their credentials and use it to do something bad. But we know that somebody's attempting to do this. And so this is a valuable signal for us. Uh, for example, we found a developer, uh, luckily it was a developer, trying to do this. They tried to take credentials from the instance, even though we have this nice paved road solution. They tried to use those to do something that to us looked like an attacker. And we were able to immediately go to that developer, find out what they were trying to do, help them, and then also make sure that this uh, doesn't happen in a malicious use case, which is a nice thing to be able to do. The more signals that we can get, 
about things going wrong in our environment, the better we can react quickly. So continuing on this thread of anomalous behavior in our environment, let's add some onions to the pizza. I know that Will uh, gets a little choked up when he thinks about veggies, mm -hmm. but I think of the majority of us can agree that we want some veggies. It shouldn't just be a big pile of meat on the pizza. So we're going to add some onions now. Let's talk about detecting anomalous behavior in our environments. So we're doing repo kid stuff. We're continuously watching CloudTrail. We know what applications and what users are doing and what's normal. And from that, we get some kind of cool properties. For example, some regions are not valid for Netflix. We don't use them. We have a regional alignment strategy, which says that we should be using certain regions. And if we see somebody doing activity out of those regions, that's a big red flag to us. All of our tooling is, has been built to deploy in certain regions. And so something out of this is like, whoa, what's going on here? Now, we know what those regions are. And my fellow Netflixers know what the regions are. But the attacker does not. And so they have to be very careful when they're doing things in our environment not to trip on the wrong region. Similarly, certain resources shouldn't be used. Think about you know, your traditional uh, honey pot, right? We've got resources in our environment that have no legitimate use. They are just there to trip up an attacker. Now, even knowing that, it's like having the alarm sign in my yard, right? We're protected. Don't come to this house. Like me telling you that doesn't do anything except for maybe help you to go attack one of our competitors or something. But for us, it's a big deterrent. Because attackers have to be very careful. They can't just crawl and look for something interesting. It might be one of our traps. Similarly, certain services are never used at Netflix. They're used elsewhere. You would find them in typical enumeration tools. But for Netflix, they're not valid. So when we see one of these services go off, hey, this service has been used for the first time, that's a big red flag to us that we can go and check and see what's going on. Is this a developer? Was there a compromise? And then triage from there. So this is a perk of continuously watching our cloud trail. And it's very expensive to do it. Uh, I think more than $100,000 for us. And it can easily get even more expensive than that, depending on what you want to do with it. But that being said, we get so many benefits from it. From diagnosis, obviously security impacts that I'm talking about with RepoKid and this kind of anomaly detection. So we feel like it's a worthwhile investment. So an example of what, when we actually caught somebody using an oddball service. There are some AWS enumeration scripts. If you get a point of presence on an instance, or you, know, you pop an application, and you want to figure out what AWS permissions you have, you might run one of these scripts. And what it does is it just simply goes through a list and calls out various actions, you know, list buckets or uh, list access keys and things like that. Now, an attacker uh, had, was a very uh, gifted application security tester, was able to compromise our app in our bug bounty, bounty program, and then did not know as much about AWS. So they used one of these off-the-shelf scripts. And the script immediately tripped up one of our, whoa, what is this service things? And we were able to stop them in their tracks, which was pretty cool. OK, now we're going to add some anchovies to the pizza. Who likes anchovies? Lies. Nobody likes anchovies. Not as many people as liked onions. Yeah, that's, that, that's true. <laughs> Actually, when we showed this presentation to our vice president, Jason, he said, those don't even look like anchovies. These look like barracudas. <laughs> Anybody like barracudas on their pizza? <laughs> yes. OK. That was more than anchovies. Yeah, yeah seriously. <laughs> All right, we're building up. <laughs> onions, anchovies, barracudas. Now, this is very similar to the last control, except for we're going to apply it at the application or role level. So because we're uh, monitoring the cloud trail, we know what consistent behavior should be for an application. If we see something out of the ordinary, this is a big red flag for us. So a lot of times, when an attacker gets into an environment, they will do some of these enumeration things that I mentioned previously. List buckets, list access keys, get caller identity. These are pretty common from an attacker script. Uh, get caller identity, in case you aren't aware, is basically like the AWS version of uh, who am I on Linux. You run it, it tells you what role you're, you're using. So this would obviously be something attackers would want to use first. Coincidentally, applications have almost no need to do it. 
And so when we see something like this, especially from an application that's never done it before, this is screaming at us to go take a look. So we caught one of our curious developers. Uh, this thing went off at 8 p.m. I think maybe Will caught it and he came, Travis, what is this? <laughs> okay, let's reach out. Let's, let's reach out to the developer and see, is this legitimate or is the application compromised? And it was a S3 list buckets. So this is something, the application doesn't even use S3. And all of a sudden they're trying to list the buckets. An attacker might do that to see, hey, is there anything juicy I can get my hands on? But this application had never done it. So we were able to immediately reach out to the developer on Slack, say, hey, what's going on? Why is uh, S3 list buckets happening? And it turned out in their case that they were just trying to do some research or a side project and they were using their already existing application to do it. But I am very confident that one of these days we're gonna see this exact same thing and it's going to be an attacker because this is a super valuable signal for us. Okay, so it's been cartoon pizzas to this point. Now we're getting real. We're getting photorealistic pizza. This one in particular looks really good. Um, I'm pretty sure that I'm gonna have to go get pizza after this. And this is actually coincidentally my favorite control. So traditionally at Netflix what we've had is one role that's common to a class of user. And what we want instead is specific roles for each user. Now why do we want that? First of all, if we have all users get the same permissions within a class, then we're over-provisioning. Same problem we have with RepoKid. We're not anywhere close to least privileged. Instead, what we'd like to do is observe the user behavior, see what the users actually need to do their job, and then trim down to the rest. This is also very useful for us because we can detect anomalous behavior. If a user is doing a bunch of S3 stuff and then all of a sudden they start firing IAM calls, which by the way, nobody should be using IAM in Netflix. That's one of those things that uh, our team keeps very tight control of. And it, there's, no use, there's no use for normal users to be using IAM. So if we see a user, they're a standard user, they do S3, SQS, stuff like that, and then all of a sudden they're firing IAM stuff, this is a big signal for us. So we really get two benefits here. We get anomalous behavior detection and we get least privilege per uh, user roles. And if a user wants to do something, remember that slide with the guy with the gun to his head? If a user wants to go off and do something a little bit you know, risky or unusual, we can give that permission just to the one user rather than having to grant it to the entire class of users, which is pretty good. Okay, next up, more photorealistic pizza, more cool controls. Over to Will. Sweet, thanks Travis. <clears throat> so as we move over to unique uh, roles per user and start looking individually at what users are actually doing in our account, which we've normally just said, it's a mixed bag. Certain users are doing something, certain users are doing something else, but we have to keep this broad permission across. And we can't really get rid of these roles. We can't remove users because we're not sure when are they actually using them, when are they not. But now that we're moving to a unique role per user, uh, provision at time of login, we can start keeping track of when was the last time Travis logged into the account? You know, Travis is just a user. Forget that he's an admin. He's a developer in our uh, environment. He worked on a team, did some development for six months, and then he transferred teams. He's no longer working in the studio. He's now working on some central engineering. So he no longer uses the studio accounts that he once did. Normally, he might just retain that access. Does anyone here have a really good offboarding control? No hands. Two, Lies. two three Lies. hands. Uh, it's a really hard problem, right? I, I think if, if you develop a company in our industry that can solve that problem, like gold, next, next unicorn company. But it's a really hard problem. And so what we want to do is kind of keep that repo kid mindset and start looking at when is a, not only what actions are you using, but are you using that role altogether? And if you're not even logging into that role, should you still be in the group that provides you access to that role? And so we're looking at now, how do we remove users from account access when they're not using it? Keeping that all in mind where there's some central support teams that only need access to things in incident cases. You know, Netflix went down for a brief second, or there's an internal service in this account that's showing it's, it's flapping back and forth. It's good or it's bad. Uh, that's when they might need that access. So we want to make sure that we, if we remove people 
from accounts so they can easily get that access back. And so have this like good circle of granting access, removing access, but overall kind of trimming down to that least privilege from a what permissions you actually use as well as what accounts can you actually access. You no longer use this, this feature, we should just remove that from you. Uh, and so that's what we're looking at now is adopting our repo kid to just removing account access altogether and no longer just removing roles or the, the permissions, right? We want to remove the permissions as you uh, don't use them, but we want to remove your entire account access altogether if you're not going to even do that anymore. And so that's going to be pretty effective, we think, but something that we're, we're currently working towards. What's the right balance between auto removal and how do you get access back quickly such that in an event of an incident or a, an outage or something, the, the central core teams can actually do their work without having to page us in in the middle of the night. I like not being paged when we have an outage. Uh, I only want to be paged if there's some security thing or some access that they don't have. Uh, so let's make sure that we can do this very well. So it reduces our risk of user compromise. If you don't have that access, you just don't have it. You know, if you got compromised, there's no, there's no pivoting to other accounts as a malicious actor. You just have the access to what that person's normally doing. And the next step in the evolution of just protecting credentials, uh, we've mentioned the metadata service a couple times already. Is anyone intimately familiar with the metadata service in AWS or GCP or any? Uh, I've spent a lot of time investigating how does the metadata service work? How do you even protect the metadata service? And so what we came up with was a solution uh, in how you could actually protect the metadata service in AWS to prevent things such as server-side request forgery. Just to show of hands, everyone look forward, don't look at your neighbors. We don't know who's raising their hand, but has anyone ever fallen prey to SSRF in your account and had credentials compromised? All right, we've got a couple honest people in the crowd. Uh, I'd be willing to bet there's more than the people that raise their hand, but it's a common attack vector for a researcher, for a malicious actor. If I find SSRF, and I know that you're running in AWS, I'm going to go straight for the, the gold, straight for the credentials. Most bug bounty programs are gonna label that as a critical finding. You can get max payout. And most importantly, that is potentially your first pivot away from owning that account. I think there was a really good write up on one of the bug bounty programs of how a simple SSRF led to entire account compromise within one of the cloud providers. And so, being that we don't want our credentials to be compromised and our team owns kind of the IAM infrastructure and credentials all together at Netflix, how could we actually prevent credential compromise at this source? So if you're not familiar with server-side request forgery, I'd like to just walk you through a simple example. You have a, a malicious actor on the left. He's doing a get request to a web application. That web application is actually making a request to a remote app of sort. It does a get request, receives that response, and then combines that information and serves it back to that malicious actor. If that malicious actor is actually able to modify and use user input to trick the application to requesting a different endpoint, then the actor can actually say, hey, why don't you request the metadata endpoint for me? And more specifically, let's request the security credential endpoint. And so it takes two HTTP calls to get credentials in AWS once you find a server-side request forgery. One call to figure out what role it's running as, and then the second call to say, give me credentials for that role. So in this case, the actor has tricked the application to say, hey, please give me the metadata service instead. Give me some credentials. And the web application is saying, sure, no problem, here you go. You know, there's various libraries I think that people have created that would allow you to actually detect these kind of things. You can put some WAF rules in place and hope that you can detect recognizing the IP address for the metadata service. It becomes an infinitely hard problem when you try to enumerate all the different possibilities of how can you represent the 169.254.169.254 address, which is where all the metadata services in the cloud are hosted. It even gets more difficult when you realize that you can just put a bitly address in there and your web application is actually going to uh, resolve that and then get the requests themselves. And so what we did was we worked with AWS to try to solve this problem, right? We wanted to go ahead and drill this into the metadata service 
itself and say, hey, let's just require a header. If you require a header on the metadata service, this problem goes away. Uh, didn't really get traction there. We asked the SDK team, hey, can we just add a header? And the SDK team didn't really feel comfortable with adding a header to uh, the SDK calls that the metadata service didn't support, which I can understand. And so I started just building this proof of concept proxy. What's traffic look like when you're actually talking to the metadata service? And I realized, oh yeah, user agent is sent on every request. And one thing I found across all the libraries in AWS is that they weren't setting it to anything. And so I wanted to go and see if I just made a PR to these open source AWS SDKs, could I get them to accept them? And so I started with the Ruby library, actually convinced the Ruby team to accept it. I took that PR to the Java team, used it as, hey, the, the Ruby guys are doing this, you should do this too. <laughs> took that to the Java 2 team because there's an evolution of the Java SDK. Said, hey, the other Java guys are doing this, you should do it too. And then eventually got it through to all the different libraries. And so now I'm happy to announce that with AWS metadata service, or the SDKs, the SDKs are now setting a user agent that you can predict and know is from the SDKs. And so now a request from an SDK has a user agent that says BOTO3. And so then it'll go through the metadata proxy and you can say, yep, I'm expecting user agents that look like this that are from the verified AWS SDKs. Let's allow this to actually go through to the metadata service, return those credentials back. And so if you're an attacker, and you're, in this case, I have a Python uh, Flask app running. I'm using Python requests under the hood to make the remote app fetch from the example before. If I'm an attacker doing SSRF and exploiting that, and I want to get metadata credentials, the request that the metadata proxy is going to see in front of that metadata service is the user agent Python requests. If you're using Java and you don't set a user agent, it's going to be Java. And so in this case, we're actually able to intercept that request to the metadata service and block that, X, that SSRF uh, and alert or whatever you want to do. But now you're actually able to use the AWS SDKs, put a proxy in place, and protect your applications uh, against this type of attack. Uh, there's an example on our GitHub if you're interested in learning more about it. Uh, but literally in 100 lines of Go, you can deploy a proxy and protect your applications, as long as you're on the latest uh, SDK. Uh, get your question in a second, if you don't mind. And with that, hot and ready for Travis. Okay. He didn't mean it like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, <laughs> we've got all these ingredients, and we're putting them together, and any one ingredient is fine, right? We can make a little incremental security improvement, but the real benefit we get is when we layer them together and then we get something that's hard to overcome as an attacker. I like to think of it like this show, because of course Netflix, I have to plug Netflix shows. <laughs> Ultimate Beastmaster, anybody seen it? Good. So the way that the, sh the show works is it's this continuous obstacle course where you start off somewhere over here or maybe over there and you come down and any one of these individual obstacles is very difficult. I couldn't do any of them for sure. But when you put them all together in an obstacle course where you have to go all the way through, the situation that you end up in is that the world's best athletes have a hard time getting through. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with our layered controls. We have the pepperoni and the barracudas and all this stuff, and we put them together, and now you have to you know, know about signals and which things are locked down, and it becomes very difficult for an attacker to manage. And our whole idea is to incentivize attackers to go somewhere else or give up and pick up a different line of work. And so we hope that we've done this. We hope that if there are any of you that would like to contribute or work together on the next ingredient, let's chat. We've got, here are some of the ones we've discussed. And at this point, we can open it up for any questions that you might have. There was one back there, yes. Yeah. So I was just wondering, with the uh, user agent technique, yeah. Well, so the, the one nice thing about in uh, SSRF or XXE, depending on how you actually have the code implemented, the user agent is not controllable by that attacker. Um, so unless you're actually accepting the CRLF uh, characters and actually allowing them to do a line, uh, carriage return line feed and set the user agent, 
that's uncontrollable. And so we're, we're banging on the fact that an attacker cannot use a user agent. And so the, really, the attack that we're preventing is a remote uh, exploit through an application that's vulnerable to these uh, with the idea that you can't control the user agent. And in the things that we've seen uh, talk, and talking to others, that's the type of attack that have been exploited. Uh, and so this doesn't uh, prevent you from any sort of other I RCE or other app exploit where if you're able to actually control user agent. And if someone's on box and actually controlling the user agent, then we have a whole new problem. So, Jim, do you have a question? Or? So, I mean, Jim's got a few, but I mean, kind of bolting onto that, like as I'm thinking of that problem through with the user agent from like 100% of SSRF vulnerabilities down to like a fraction. Yep. So. And I think on top of that, uh, if, we'll repeat. Oh, so <laughs> the idea was that if, if you're able to craft the entire request and bypass this type of protection, that you still might see potentially two user agents or something abnormal, and you're still cutting the fraction of attacks down to a mere percent versus all the SSRF attacks are, are uh, available. And from to that point, I think on top of that, you could do other things, depending on how you implement the proxy, if you have some sort of logging to say, these are the user agents I'm seeing in the path. As an attacker, you're still gonna have to understand what version of the SDK I'm running, what version language am I running, and those kind of things. To, you could do some anomaly detection on what user agents am I actually seeing. So even though you might not protect, or if, if there's an attacker that's able to bypass this type of protection, you could still do some anomalous uh, alerting and be able to either prevent that credential from working altogether or uh, revoke it as you see that happen. I, I really like what APF said this morning. Uh, you know, basically, there's always going to be edge cases associated, but even getting to the state where we're worried about edge cases rather than a main vector is a big improvement. So start focusing on these smaller problems, and then you can worry about making it perfect. Yeah. Sure. SSR. That's why we're all buzzing about this. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, definitely. I, so, are we doing anything to, to help the our developers prevent this type of attack altogether? So, just some hygiene and development. And I believe uh, our AppSec team are doing those kind of things. And as we see these types of things internally, we're proactively talking to our developers and seeing are there patterns across our environment? Are there certain libraries that we can? Uh, push towards our developers to use that automatically protect against these kind of things. Uh, so I, I believe we're doing that. I'd have to direct you to our AppSec team that's here today, uh, funny enough. But um, we're definitely trying to identify the result. And this is a mere, we want, we need to do something to protect our credentials. So we're trying to sh put something in. And I think the, the end result is if the AWS team can fix the metadata itself and add a header, as well as Google and the, all the other providers, right? It, it's a problem that's being seen. It's really hard to, from a WAF perspective, try to prevent. Um, and so even if this happened in our environment, right, we're only preventing the exploit on the metadata credential. We're not preventing the pivot scenario. So there's still a whole thing that we have to solve. And obviously, the, I think that the right approach is to figure out how to solve it from a library perspective and make sure the applications don't have it ever. Um, but this is at least our team's area of focus on preventing uh, credential compromise. Question? Yeah. So uh, on our on our actual application, so uh, sorry, the question was: uh, It seems like we're creating credentials on the fly. Is there a way that we could actually time box credentials? So application credentials are created uh, as an application is deployed, and then the the credentials that the metadata process, proxy is serving uh, is the actual credentials from the metadata service itself. And so we're just transparently proxying to if the user agent's correct. Uh, so on our actual servers, we're not on the fly provisioning credentials. Um, so we're using whatever the EC2 service is providing to that service at the, the given time. For users, though, we could potentially say, here's your one day roll. And then after today, it's gone. You need to request another one. But there's, we could do potentially some time boxing there. But we don't do anything uh, with applications that way. Other question? User number times n roles to manage. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the question is, there's role explosion associated with doing unique roles per user, and how do we manage that, right? Um, yeah, so we have built a lot of tooling around managing roles because it's one of the things that my team does the most. We uh, have definitely made our bread and butter over um, tooling that does that and, and makes it easy for us. Now, yes, we have a, an explosion of roles, and there are limits. We can work with AWS to increase those limits in cases. And uh, the auditability actually goes up because well, instead of uh, you having like this super set of all the things that users use for a certain role, now we have individual 
actions by a user. And so what we can see is this specific user did a thing rather than the entire class of users, somebody within it did a thing. Uh, the question is, why do an identity check at the role level? Um, we're actually not doing an identity check at the role level. What, what we have is an identity check prior to uh, getting the role. And so if everything checks out with your identity, um, then you can get access to this role that you need in AWS. And the system that's doing this is outside of AWS. Do you have a oh, sorry, uh, you got your hand up before. Thank you so Sure. Uh, the question is, how do we continuously monitor our cloud trail logs? Uh, we're doing it with Elasticsearch, and the way, uh, so basically we have a process that cloud trail logs get delivered to an S3 bucket, and then periodically we scan the S3 bucket for new logs, we ingest them into Elasticsearch, and from there we have a nice Kibana dashboard that we can use for manual investigations, and we can also um, programmatically query it with Elasticsearch DSL. Yeah, we're also using Airbnb uh, Stream Alert for a real-time CloudTrail log pipeline uh, that's all based off Lambda and just can parallelize as you scale out. So there's, I would, uh, long story short, there's many different ways that we're doing this, but majority of these things are through a centralized logging platform like Kibana that we push all the CloudTrail to, as well as a combination of some of the rule sets that we've developed in StreamAlert. Um, so if you haven't checked out Airbnb StreamAlert, it's a really good tool. Okay, we're getting the wrap it up sign. So if there are more questions, we'd love to chat outside. We're gonna be around all day. With that, good job. <laughs>